الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن دعا بدعوته واستنى بسنتي إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد فأوصيكم ونفسي بالتقوى الله عز وجل والسمع والطاعة ويقول الحق سبحانه أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاتي ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون All praises are due to Allah, Lord of the worlds, and surely the best reward ultimately is for those who have taqwa. And surely there is no animosity except for the oppressor. And I bear witness that Allah is one and has no partners, and that Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, is his servant, his last messenger. May Allah always, constantly, send peace and blessings to Muhammad to his family, his companions, and all those who call to his way and establish his sunnah to the day of judgment. As to what follows, I begin by reminding myself of the extreme importance of taqwa, the consciousness of Allah, the fear of Allah, the hope in the mercy of Allah, surrounding ourselves with the reality of the creator of the heavens and the earth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed to us in his mighty book, O you who believe, fear Allah in the way he should be feared to the best of your ability and do not die except in a state of Islam. So in this mighty oft-repeated ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is connecting our taqwa, connecting our consciousness of our relationship with him, connecting it straight through that we should try our best, that we should fear Allah, we should have taqwa in the best possible way that we can. Nobody will be the same, but as long as we sincerely try to keep that connection with Allah under all circumstances, in all different ways, aspects of our life, then inshallah, Allah will have mercy upon us and allow us to continue where the end of the ayah says, do not die except in a state of Islam. So this verse is talking about a transition. It's talking about longevity. It's talking about not taqwa in short bursts, not taqwa on Juma day and you forget it on Saturday. Not taqwa in Ramadan, and then after the fast is over, our, our personality changes. But that we should strive to flow with the consciousness of Allah, the ups and the downs, to make it all the way to the end, to reach the goal, which is to meet Allah Azza wa Jal. And this taqwa, is such an important quality. It's something that cannot be measured in clothing or slogans, but it is the actual conscience of the person. It is the understanding of the person. And it is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh, you who believe, two weeks ago I was called to a distant part of Western Africa to a place called Sokoto in Nigeria, which is the mouth of the Sahara Desert. And as we are in temperatures that are getting colder and colder, there in the desert, the average temperature is 38 degrees centigrade. This is the average temperature. And in flying over the desert and coming down into this historic town, I was surprised to see that the people were uh, living in a type of Islamic 
uh, bubble. They were living in an Islamic world. 99% of the women wearing hijab. 90% of the men actually were wearing Islamic clothes. When the time comes for prayer, if they couldn't make it in the masjid, they pray in the streets. They pray in the front of their business. They pray wherever they can because they recognize that prayer is part of their life. It is not a separate thing that you do when you feel bad or you want something from Allah, but it is part of the rhythm of life. And that is one of the beauties of taqwa when it actually becomes a reality in the life of a person. I was called there by the Sultan of Sokoto, the highest religious authority, maybe in the whole of the African continent, because they are bringing the memory of Sheikh Uthman Denfodio, Rahimahullah. And he being a direct descendant of the Sheikh and also carrying his flag, called people for a whole week of gatherings, lectures, night vigils, television programs, radio programs, talking about the life of this individual and his importance. And they wanted to hear something from the outside. They wanted to see if this has an impact upon people who are not living within their, their lands. And alhamdulillah, in reaching there and being with the people and realizing that they were serious about studying the life of this scholar, I reminded myself of the importance of this individual. And we're talking today about longevity. It was in 1774 that he went into the field as a Maliki Faqih, a scholar, and he began to do dawah to his people for 30 years, struggling with their social problems, struggling with their religious problems. And after a period of time, in moving through this huge bit of land, he would move from one place to another with a thousand students. So literally, wherever they were, in the desert or the savannah, whenever they stopped, that was their university. And they continued on. And in this period of time, and I'm thinking about longevity, why is it that in 1804, they established a state of Islam. They were attacked by evil kings, and they opened up 250,000 square kilometers and governed it with Sharia for 100 years before the coming of the British. But still, after the colonial rule, after suffering, they continued. The consciousness is there. The political power, the military power stopped for a while, but the consciousness of the people, it is there still amongst them. And that is a great blessing. And in looking at his life, and he is considered in this region to be a mujaddid, to do tajdeed, and that is the revival of Islam. Because during that 30 year period, he called the people to Islam, he looked, he addressed the social ills, not looking at political things. What are the social problems? What are the family problems? What are the problems with the youth? He fought and struggled for women education, that women have to be educated in Islam. He struggled and he corrected the innovations that had come into the religious practice. And he showed them, separate your culture from your religion. Separate whatever your culture may be, your tribal customs, separate it from your deen. And if there are bad aspects of your tribal way of life, take it out of your Islam. And so he strived and struggled in this. And it is reported that in 1788, the young scholar was called to a place called Gobir. 
And the evil ruler at the time named Bawa tried to assassinate him. Think about our scholars today. He first tried to assassinate him. That didn't work. Allah protected him. And then he offered him 500 mithqals of gold. Bribery. And this is what we see in our own land. Mass repression or mass bribery. He tried to bribe him. He refused. And the sheikh told him, I have five demands. I don't want your money. Our people, we do not want your gold. But we have five demands. And think about these demands relative to our own situation. I shared this last year in a Zoom call with uh, American Muslim leaders who were looking for something from the African continent of relevance. I shared these five demands with them to show how he is continuing the sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam and bringing it alive. Number one, allow me to call to Islam freely within these lands. Number two, anybody who accepts Islam should not be forced to go back. They should freely allow to be a Muslim. Number three, treat every man with a turban and every woman with a hijab with respect. Think about our own situation in Quebec with a hijab. This is his, third, this is his next demand. Number four, free all political prisoners. This is an Islamic scholar. But he said, free all political prisoners. And five, that you should lift the taxes. Lift the unjust taxes off the masses of the people. So he was seeking economic reform. And this is important, that our Islam is connected with our economic life. Sometimes we separate our Islam and we say, no, that's religious, but now I'm doing my business. That's religious. No, I'm running a state. No, it's all together under the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so we reflected on this with the American Muslim leaders. He talked about dawah. He talked about the ability to teach Islam. And this is something we have the rights inside of this country. He also counteracted Islamophobia. The illogical fear of Muslims. Just because we look like a Muslim does not mean that we are doing something wrong. Political prisoners. In America today, and I'm speaking specifically about the United States, there are more African Americans in jail than at the height of the apartheid regime in South Africa. It is the largest prison population on earth. Hispanic people as well. Native indigenous people as well. In many cases, imprisoned for minor offenses, but forced to stay within the walls of these prisons unjustly. And he, as an Islamic scholar, let them go. And so, this is a great example of his life. In 1804, he was attacked. And his small group of people, they made hijrah. They took the pledge to the sheikh as their leader. He was not really a military person. But they took pledge to him as their leader. They defeated their enemy in a type of battle of Bedr, where they were outnumbered. Then they opened up 250,000 square kilometers. This is a huge territory. And they continued to govern with the rules of Islam for 100 years. And the longevity is still there. The Sheikh himself, once the society, the Khilafat, was established, he left the leader. A mere position. He did not want politics. He said to the people, choose your leader. 
and he spent the rest of his life teaching until he passed away. And he died at the age of 63, the time of the Prophet ﷺ. He loved Sunnah so much that Allah even blessed him with the same longevity of the Prophet ﷺ. What did they have inside of them? I want to share with you something that we studied in the desert and that we study here. When the Sheikh is looking at the problems that Muslims are facing, what is it that's holding us back? Why are, we, are our children seeming to want to leave the faith? What is wrong? There is something which is called Madakhil Iblis, and that is the inroads of the shaitan into your heart. There are some way that the evil one, well, Iyadu Billah, can enter your heart and you don't even know it. And he listed 10 things. And look at the relevancy of this in terms of longevity, our own longevity that we need today. Number one, he said, beware of hasad, jealousy, envy and jealousy. That you are jealous of another Muslim making a little bit of progress. You are jealous of a sister who just had a baby. And that hasad destroys the person with the hasad more than the other person. And the Prophet ﷺ said, "Iyakum wal hasad, fa inna al hasad yatkul hasanati kama takul nal al hatab." Beware of jealousy; it will eat up your good deeds, like a fire eats up firewood. Number two: anger, ghadab, uncontrolled emotions, getting too angry. A difference of opinion, anything. You're angry, and you don't want to see that other Muslim. The masjid starts with one, then it goes into two. And the leaders get angry with each other, and suddenly there's four. And suddenly there's eight. Because of not controlling their anger. And when a man came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Give me wasiyah, advice, and he said, La taqadab. Don't get angry. Number three. Greed and ambition. Greed, tama that you're greedy for things, greedy for power, greedy for money, greedy for position. Take it out of your hearts. We want longevity. We need to take greed out of our lives. And number four, excessive love of food and drink. So people are not eating food to survive as it originally was supposed to be. They eat the food because they love the taste of the food. They love the sugar. They love the pepper. They love the drink. When that excessive love comes, your desires then build up and the devil takes control of you. Number five, haste, doing things too fast, except in necessary acts of worship. So he said that, yes, if you, are, if you have a zad wa rahila, if you have the ability to make hajj, then make it right away. Don't wait 20 years. But haste, don't think about what you're doing before you make an action. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Ajala min as shaitan Clearly, he said, haste is from the devil. Number six, wealth. One of the inroads of shaitan to the heart is wealth if it exceeds your necessities. So if your money is now more than your necessities to live a decent life, that is a danger. Beware of that wealth. Seven, and this is an interesting point from the middle of the desert. He said, fanaticism in your school of jurisprudence. I'm a Maliki, I'm a Shafi, I'm a Hanafi, I'm a Salafi, I'm a Sufi. Fanaticism. And this is one of the problems dividing us and keeping us away from longevity. And number eight, Hatred and contempt for those people who disagree with us. And sometimes there are Muslims who would disagree, and we should agree to disagree and continue to make dua for them. Because there's many ways to make salat. The Prophet ﷺ gave us many different options in our life. Number nine, burdening the common people with philosophical arguments about the names and descriptions of Allah. 
philosophy, burdening the common people. Why do you get them involved in these arguments? Go online and see some of the hair-splitting arguments that are going on. You see how the evil can come. And number 10, holding suspicion against Muslims. That means you suspect somebody, right? Suwadhan, you suspect them. Take that out of your heart. We need to clear our hearts from any suspicion we have of another person. No matter what country he comes from, no matter what language he speaks, clear our hearts. And these blocking of the doors, this blocking of the doors can help us to have that pure heart so we can live up to the verse. Wala tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. Stay on the path until you die in a state of Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with longevity in our faith. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon Sheikh Uthman Danfodio and all our great leaders and mujaddids. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raise up from our youth people who will renew this faith. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give our leaders that ability to distinguish between right and wrong and have humility in their lives. I say what I have said. وَلِسَائِلِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ مِنْ كُلِّ ذَنْبٍ إِسْتَغْفِرُوا إِنَّهُ غَفُورٌ